So, uh, yeah, so, so welcome to the session. Um, so here, uh, you know, we're basically going to talk about uh, some, you know, techniques, some functional programming techniques that uh, that we can, you know, use JavaScript for. Uh, so I, I don't have a lot of, you know, a lot of text. So, uh, so those are my, uh, you know, that's that's where I blog at. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. Um, so that's that's the agenda for today, right? Um, which is going to cover these things. So very briefly, you know, that's the that's the agenda, right? So that's what we're going to look at. Uh, so it's it's kind of funny that you know uh, today we use JavaScript as a language for for you know for so many different things, right? So many different scenarios. Obviously, uh, you know, building web applications, you know, adding intelligence on the client side, on the browser side of things is probably the primary use case. Now we find that you know JavaScript is slowly migrating and you know kind of uh, into all other environments as well. You know, we have a track on Node.js here, so you know, JavaScript on the server is a is a pretty big, uh, pretty big deal these days. Um, so you know, here in this session, we're just going to you know kind of talk about some language features in JavaScript. Uh, you know, kind of explore some of the functional aspects of, of JavaScript, right? What are some of the functional techniques that you can uh, that you can take advantage of in JavaScript? Uh, so we we'll just you know kind of uh, walk through a bunch of uh, bunch of demos. Yeah. So this this is pretty much the only slide in my in my uh, you know session today, uh, other than some pointers to some resources and stuff. <coughs> So with that, uh, let's let's quickly you know get started. Um, so it's kind of you know interesting how JavaScript you know from, and there's a lot of uh, you know some of the principles, some fundamental aspects of languages. The language itself is rooted in functional uh, aspects, you know, functional principles. Um, so the first thing that I want to kind of talk about is the is the fact that functions in JavaScript are you know first class citizens of the language. Uh, so what do I mean by that? So pretty much throughout this session, I'll be uh, using a little little console that I put together here. Um, so you know, this is just a little. Uh, I don't know how audible, okay, how visible this is. So this is just a little console that we'll be using to, uh, you know, explore various various aspects of JavaScript. Uh, basically, some of the things that you can do here is, uh, you know, you can you can type type script here. So I can say, you know, alert something, and uh, and I can hit Control Enter, and then it just runs the script. Uh, you know, using alerts for printing keyword statements is kind of annoying. So you can say, you know, print something. And uh, you know, it prints the text on the right hand side over there. Uh, so if you have some errors here, then the errors show up at the bottom right hand corner over there. So those are some things that you can do with the console. Uh, so we'll use this to kind of explore uh, various aspects of the language. Uh, <coughs> functions are a first class citizen of the language, right? So uh, what, do, what do we mean by that? You know, it's useful to think of uh, functions in JavaScript as uh, you know as, as being equivalent to pretty much like a variable, right? So, so if you create a variable, assign a value to it. What, what all can you do with the variable, right? So you can obviously declare it. You can assign values to it. You can uh, pass uh, variables as parameters to functions. You can return variables from functions, right? You can construct uh, you know JavaScript objects where variables are members. You can create objects and have variables as members and you know a bunch of things that you can do. Turns out in JavaScript, this is probably a little counterintuitive to folks who are coming from other languages, right? From C++, C Sharp, Java. Uh, it turns out that functions uh, can be used in pretty much all of these ways that we just spoke about, right? So for example, so what can you do with the, uh, with the variable? So you can you can define one, right? So obviously this is something that you've probably done, right? Pretty straightforward stuff. So all I'm doing here is declaring a function and I'm calling it, right? So that's nothing major. Uh, all right. So uh, you know, functions are uh, 
I mean, this is this nothing, right? Okay. You've done this. So you've written functions to validate your uh, forms and whatnot. So it turns out you can do you know a lot of things with functions that you can do with variables. So for instance, uh, I can take this function, assign it to another variable, right? So I can say var f equals two, and I can call it through that, uh, you know, and and that works as well, right? Again, nothing major, no big deal. Uh, what else can you do? So for instance, I can have a, a function like this, right? And do that. So let me uh, get rid of that. So here, what I'm doing is, uh, and you can see that you know you're still a little bit. So what's happening here? So I've defined a function called cb, which takes one parameter, uh, and that parameter is basically another function, right? Yeah. It's browser based, right? Con control plus plus. It's browser based. Browser based. Yeah. No, I just wanted to know if it's browser based. Okay. Control oh, yeah, plus. Yeah. plus. Yeah. Now the problem is this thing goes away if I make it. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything for Linux? Sorry. <laughs> So, right, so here what's happening is you know we are basically passing a function <coughs> to another function, right? So CB is taking one parameter and passing a function to that. Turns out you can call that function just like you know any other function, right? So within CB, uh, what have I done here? In CB I'm passing this as a parameter and I can call that from there. Uh, Again, this is just one one step extra, right? We created a variable, assigned a function to that variable, and called it through that. Here, we just passing it as a parameter to another function. Uh, now, there are you know more interesting things. You know, as you as you keep exploring this, it gets weirder and weirder. Uh, for instance, what can you do with variables? You can return variables from functions, right? So you can do that with functions. I mean, uh, you can do that with functions too. So, for instance, uh, you know, let's create uh, let's create a some sort of increment or something like that, right? So I'll say uh, make inc, right? And from here, I'll say return function of something. And uh, here I say return b plus inc. Right? Now let's say inc five is make inc of five. Now what will what will inc five have here, right? Uh, any guesses? Right. So inc5 here simply points to a function which takes one parameter, and whatever parameter you pass to it, it will add five to it and return that. Right. So for example, if I say print inc5 of ten, what's what's it going to print? It prints fifteen, right? So so what's what's going on here? So in this case, when I call make inc, make inc is actually returning another function from within that function. Just like how you can do it, you can return values from functions. Functions can be written from functions as well, right? Uh, and and the interesting thing here is one thing that if you if you are like uh, you know really thinking about it, so inc is a is a variable that uh, is basically a parameter to making, uh, and then from within that function I'm returning that, right? Now at this point, when this particular line is going to get execute, making is already done. I've called making function, it's executed. And uh, that's it, right? Now, now, what, what about this variable i and c? It should have, it should have, it's gone, right? Once that function leaves scope, all the variables that are declared within that, the parameters, everything is gone. But when I call it here, when I say i and c five of ten, what am I doing inside that function? I'm saying whatever parameter you pass, v plus i and c, right? How does, how does that work? Closures, right? So uh, probably I can just rush through this. Uh, uh, yeah, so that's that's the concept of a closure, where whenever you declare a function, uh, all the all the symbols, all the variables that are in scope at the, at the point of definition of that function become part of that function's closure, right? Which means that those symbols, those variables, are accessible to that function inside that function. So that's how. So for example, you can imagine that when inc five is instantiated, uh, there is this hidden object associated with inc five. Which has all the variables that were in scope when that function was defined. So when was this function defined? This function is defined from within make i and c, right? So at that point, whatever is accessible to that function, let's make uh, that you know anonymous function, 
is accessible to that function even after that, right? Because you can imagine, like you know, how you might how you might declare member variables in a in a static programming language like C sharp or C plus plus. So whatever uh, member fields that you declare inside a class is basically the state for that class, right? And you create an object of it, and when you pass that object around, that state goes around with that object. I mean, pretty much the object is defined by its state. Um, it kind of is similar to that. So whenever this function is created, uh, and whenever I'm calling it and so on, you can imagine that there is this hidden member, which is called as a closure, where all these you know symbols that were visible when that function was defined are part of it. Um, uh, and you know, like you can you can keep doing that. For example, I can create another increment or make inc of ten, right? And uh, this would uh, or I say I don't know twenty here, then this would be thirty, right? Um, so here the the point to remember is this is a completely separate object from inc five, right? Those are two individual objects, and this gets its own closure. Inc five gets its own closure, right? In inc five's closure. The value of the variable inc is five. In this case, it's ten, right? And that's retained across calls. <coughs> so this is very, you know, quickly the concept of a of a closure. Um, so what are some of the use cases for closures, right? Obviously, this is one. Um, like one one other place where I found it very useful to uh, use closures is in in ECMAScript five. There is this uh, there is this feature called as uh, getters and setters. Uh, how many of you are familiar with getters and setters in ES five? <coughs> About five, six people. Um, so very um, okay. How many of you are familiar with the concept of getters and setters? Okay, that's that's everybody, right? So it turns out that with ECMAScript five, uh, you can define getters and setter. Uh, you know, basically properties. Uh, you know how you, how you do in Java, right? You, you define getters and setter methods. In C sharp, you create properties, uh, and you know each language has its own way of implementing it. Turns out in AS5 you can you can do the same thing, which is I think a pretty awesome feature. So for example, if you create a, an object like this, right? Um, I don't know. Let's say let's call this person or something. And here now what I can do is I can define some properties. For example, I can say name. Uh, and what I can do is I can create two functions here, right? I can say get and I can say set. So let's say uh, in get what I do is I just print some diagnostic messages. So I say print name dot get, right? And here I'd say print name dot set plus v. Now what I can do is I can say person dot name equals something, and uh, probably in get I'll have to return something because that's what get do it get something. So I'll say uh, bar. It right? doesn't matter. I just Hard code some values for now, and here let's say print person <coughs> name, and I'll just clear the console. Um, I think that didn't work. I guess uh, I have to do it slightly differently. Name here, your person object is going to have a property called name, 
and uh, the value here is the value of that property. And there are a few other descriptors like uh, configurable. Uh, one more is there. Uh, enumerable, configurable value, and uh, what is the fourth attribute? Descriptor. That should be defined property, right? Huh? That should be defined property. That's why it's not working. Ah, uh, it should be object dot create. Oh yeah. So that's the issue. Uh, early morning brain freeze. <coughs> so there we go. Now we are back in action. Uh, it's just a different API. So there is there is a so this is object dot create. What I was trying to show you. There is another method called define property and define properties, which you can use to change the properties on an existing object. Here, what I'm doing is I'm trying to create an object, right? So basically, I'm saying that person is an object whose prototype is that empty object. It need not be empty; it could be another object. Uh, and then I'm basically defining a property called name, and I've defined two uh, methods. I mean, the getter and the setter. So when I say, when I assign a value to this, you can see that name dot set gets input, and the uh, value is obviously true. <laughs> and when I call this, you know, I'm returning one. So obviously, this is not the correct implementation here, right? So I don't want to put a hard-coded value, right? That's not the that's not the point. So the, the value should actually get stored somewhere. So I find that you know, uh, one way that you can do it is you can implement this with a uh, with a closure. So one thing that I do is I would define an immediate function like this, from which I would return my descriptor. Uh, okay. So, uh, how many of you know what is an immediate function? Is it the same as about, yeah, but four people. Uh, so, an immediate function is basically an anonymous function that gets invoked immediately. Uh, there's also, you know, some sometimes people use the term self-executing function, which I think is uh, technically incorrect. It's not a self-executing function. You know, a self-executing function is a term that you probably use to refer to a recursive function, sorry, a function that calls itself. So uh, this is not that's not what's happening here, right? We are not defining a function which is calling itself. We are defining a function which is getting called at the point of definition. Slight like technical difference. Uh, so this is an immediate function where I'm defining the function and invoking it immediately, right? So the function, this particular expression that you see here, is the function definition, and then the open bracket, close bracket to call that function, right? So it gets defined and gets called immediately. And what does that function do? It returns a regular object, right? So whatever I returned earlier, it's the same thing. It returns that. Basically, it returns the property descriptor. So now what I can do is, I can go ahead and define my backend store for this property right here. So I can say, uh, I don't know, name val or something, where, you know, I put a default value here. Um, so from here, I can return name val. And here I can assign to name, right? So now what happens is, uh, so let's say I put this here and here. Oops. It should be over here, right? Get gets called and the value is basically default. 
So the first name dot get you're seeing is from the from the getter and the value is default that's coming from the you know from that variable name there and then I'm getting set to foo and then you know the next so basically now it works like a real property but the backing store is basically uh, you know you might be wondering why I'm doing it you know in such a roundabout way but I mean I could have created uh, you know another uh, you know as you would do in C sharp or C plus plus you would create another member and then you would use that as the as the backing store for a property now you can't it's probably not a good idea to do that here because there is no concept of. A, I mean, if, if you're doing C or C sharp, you would probably use a private uh, member, right, to hide the fact that this field, uh, you know, is protected. I want to do some validation, maybe when I'm assigning a value to it. Uh, you can't do that with JavaScript, right? If you make a member, the member is accessible. So, you know, this is one place where you could use a closure to to provide a backend store for a for a getter setup property on your on your object. Uh, you could use uh, closures as private state. Which is just a, I probably won't demo that, but it's basically the same idea, right? So here, whatever is is part of the closure for a particular function is accessible only within that function, right? So you can see how you can use this concept to uh, implement the equivalent of a private uh, member in an object, right? So you can, uh, uh, you know, so you know you're probably used to creating uh, classes like this, right? So you say, you know, basically define a constructor function. You know, you have your parameters. Uh, and then you you know say this dot a equals value and so on and so forth. You define your types like this, right? So what if you wanted to create a create a private field? So you can go ahead and do this, you know, like, and then you can you know access that inside that function. So for example, have something like and this dot print here. Uh, so that's a that's a private. I mean that's a public method inside person. So when I say var p equals new person, you know, I pass the you know assume that I pass the constructor parameters and so on. Now through P, right, there's no way I can access PVT. Right? P dot PVT is not going to work now. Why? Because it's not a member of that particular object. It's simply part of the closure of the constructor function. Right? So it's basically completely hidden. So this is another you know potential application for closures where you can simulate private uh, private members in, in objects. Um, so with that let me quickly go to the one question yes. You are saying object dot create. So create is something uh, that is provided by your uh, no, no. desk or this. I mean the, the console only gives print clear and just to manage all this. So object dot create is must be five feet. Okay. So the question is uh, I think that is the feature provided by your framework, right? Why don't I just specify what attributes I require and all that closure and everything is taken care of by the framework? No, this is not my framework. Object of create is part of like ES5. That is, ES5 is the standard name for JavaScript. Uh, object of create is part of part of JavaScript. It's a language. Yeah. Basically, the idea is, uh, you know, JavaScript is a prototype prototype language, right? The fact that you can do that, what I've done at the top, function person var p equals new person, was done to make Java people happy, right? J uh, JavaScript itself is not designed that way. JavaScript is basically a, uh, is a language which uses prototypal inheritance, where you know the, the functional, I mean the, the fundamental uh, implement that you use to, uh, uh, to incorporate reusability in your in your code is by prototypal inheritance. Right? That's different from type inheritance that you do in static languages like C++ and C sharp, where you're inheriting from types. Here you don't inherit from types, you inherit from other objects. Uh, which is what object.create does. So that's something that you know uh, the standards body wanted to introduce with ES uh, with ES5, kind of move away from you know trying to do what static languages do and you know do what JavaScript is really good at doing. Uh, so even when you say var p equals new person, it's actually doing prototype inheritance under the covers. Maybe in the in the advanced JS you know session I'll, I'll talk about that. Uh, so yeah, so th that's one other application for uh, for closures. I mean obviously that's just a couple of things that I've covered. Closure is a very powerful thing that you can apply in many many other scenarios. Uh, in fact, you know the next thing that we'll talk about uh, partial functions, pa partial function application. Um, so that's that's again a functional you know programming technique or a or a feature uh, for which I will need internet. All right, so let me let me just talk about that first. Um, so imagine that you have a you have a function like this, right? Uh, they add a, b, c, right? A very trivial function where all it does is it says a plus b plus, nothing major. Right now I can say print add uh, one, two, three, and it prints that. Now, uh, 
Now what you can do is um, uh, you can you can create a function, right? Uh, where which is basically derived from another function. So what if I wanted to create a variant of add where the first parameter of add is permanently bound to a particular constant value? So for example, I want to create a version of add uh, where I can do something like this. I don't know add uh, let's say add five, right? I want to be able to say add uh, five and uh, two comma three. In this case, essentially what's going to happen is uh, five plus two plus three is going to happen, right? The the first parameter of add. Uh, is permanently bound to the constant 5. So this idea, this concept is called as partial function application. It is... Can we put a variable out there? Uh, can we put a variable? No, so I have not spoken about the implementation for that. I am just trying to describe the concept. Uh, so we will see how you can implement a uh, partial function application. Uh, the idea is, you know, if you have an existing function which takes n number of parameters, it is possible to define a variant or derive another function from that where one or more parameters of that function are, uh, you know, bound to one particular constant value. Uh, it's again sometimes referred to as currying, uh, which is incorrect. This is not currying. This is partial function application. Currying is a concept in functional programming which differs, refers to a different concept. Where the idea is, if you have a function that takes n number of parameters, you transform that into a sequence of function calls. So you can say, uh, you know, into something. Uh, currying is a different concept. So, like for example, you can do something like. Uh, Let's say curried add version is there, then I can do I can do this. So here the idea is C A of one would return another function where uh, it will uh, you know basically take any function which takes n number of parameters and transform it into an expression where all the functions take one parameter. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about currying. It's slightly confusing and frankly I'm not sure how useful that is. I found partial function application to be something that you know is something that you might really make use of in your uh, uh, in your programs. Curing is higher order function. Yes, exactly. So, um, so how can you implement uh, partial function application, right? Um, actually, I had I had made a blog post about it, and if I had an internet connection, I would just taken that code. Guys, I'm going to sit and write the code here. Uh, Till eight, is it? <coughs> really hope this works. <coughs> there you go. <coughs> Last, we're having some luck. All right, so. <coughs> What I'm going to do is I'm going to just take this definition here and uh, paste it into my console here. <coughs> uh, before I tell you what that function does, let me show you how you can use it. So I can say var add five equals partial bind of uh, of add, right? And uh, essentially the idea is you can call it like like that, right? Now I can say print add 5 and 2 comma 3 oops now I have too much code up let's go that's a nice thing about JavaScript no? I mean there's no uh, you can define anywhere everything will work alright <coughs> so Sorry. Yes. So, so what is happening here? Essentially, uh, to partial bind, the first parameter is the function add, which takes three parameters, and I have set bind the first parameter to the parameter uh, to the number five. And now I say add five and pass two and three. So basically, it returns five plus three plus two, eight plus two, ten. Now, what is happening here, right? So, what does partial bind in this case do? It's nothing. Uh, not rocket science. So, there's a lot of validation and things. Forget about all that. The key, the key aspect is uh, right here, right. So as we saw a little earlier, this is basically a function that is returning another function. Right. So functions are first class citizens of the language. You can do pretty much anything. You can do with variables and functions. And what does this function do? Uh, it basically takes all the parameters that were passed to that function. So basically, here we can see there are two things, right. The, the first thing is this function called partial bind, 
uh, which takes uh, you know a variable number of arguments. The first two arguments have to be the reference to the function and uh, ignore context for now. It's not very important. The first parameter is the function which you are uh, doing the partial bind to. <coughs> and then what I basically do is I take the rest of the arguments. So basically I take the arguments uh, that were passed to partial bind. I assume that arguments from uh, you know position 3 and up are the parameters that are being uh, permanently bound to a constant value. So I basically transform my arguments array into a into a JavaScript array, uh, arguments pseudo array into a JavaScript array, and I get the values from position two to uh, you know how many parameters are passed. And in the actual function which gets called, what I do is <coughs> uh, I just take the values that were passed to that function and build another arguments array and call the original function. Uh, I know I'm probably not making a lot of sense. Uh, see, here, do you get that? Like here, basically, I'm building a params array by, you know, taking my arguments. So this little line of code that you see here, that is there because of a weirdness in JavaScript. Uh, the arguments, you know, uh, the arguments is, is like a magic variable that's there in all functions, right? So if you have a function taking a number of parameters, the arguments is the keyword that you can use to access all of them. Uh, in a non-deterministic fashion, right? If you want to create a function which has, oh, okay, which has a variable number of parameters, you can use arguments to access them. <coughs> so basically, I'm converting that into an array because arguments is not a JavaScript array. It is basically an object that looks like an array. You can access its members through an indexer. It has a length property, uh, but otherwise, it's not an array. Here, what I do is I basically take, you know, uh, from that array. Whichever uh, the values are, which are constant, right? Which needs to be permanently bound to uh, a particular constant value. And this argument is the arguments for this function, right? When it's actually called. So this is the argument which I'm getting. So I basically take, uh, iterate through these arguments and build my actual parameters, right? <coughs> so what does it have? This arguments array. It has the first parameters that were permanently bound, and then I push the other ar arguments that are being passed to this function. And then I finally call the original function, which is the f that was passed there, and pass these arguments here. So it's just the you know uh, I know that sounds very complicated, but it, it just does the does the work. Right? It just implements the functionality. So this allows you to you know. Um, sorry. That there are two returns because the first one we are returning the function, right? Yeah. So this is what happens. Oh, <coughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. So here we have add five, and then the second returns inside add, <coughs> and, and you can keep going actually. So for example, I can say add five ten, right? Equals partial bind. So this is like we can compose on top of add five, and I can say uh, ten. I guess uh, things has to be passed. Why is null part of that? The null is basically the context for that particular uh, function call. What do I mean by context? So in a function, you can access your this member, right? So you can say this dot something. So in case you want to call a function and bind the context which is the this member to a particular object, then you can pass uh, the second parameter for that. But isn't that a problem because uh, once you bind, uh, let's say you want to do it multiple times, the first bound context will always be the bound context. You can't override that's, it. Again. That's true. Yeah. Probably that's, that's a design so it's problem. It's not a. So it's not a very useful thing to do here. Yeah, I think you can just get it out of the context. It makes sense. <coughs> I mean, his point was once you bind the function to a particular object as the context, then that kind of binds it permanently to that, right? So probably not no, very useful. That's the point of uh, taking context as an argument. So rather than somebody providing you a bound function, they can provide you the context at runtime. Yes, I mean, but the idea is, you know, if as he says, we don't, you know, bind a context there, you can use Java's ES5 bind to bind to whatever you want. Right? But if it doesn't give you a bound function, then you cannot add later bind it to it. See, okay, you create binding. Uh, I mean, by giving context, you know, the advantage to bind it here. Huh, but see, if you, so for example, here, right, I'm not binding this to anything, right, I've given null. But what can I do? So let's say I have some object here, right, I can do something like, you know, var, uh, var f equals add 510.bind of obj, right, now the context in f is obj. Okay. Uh, I have till 10.5. Yeah, so it's like 10 more minutes for q and okay. if there are any q and otherwise you can So let's just show this one more thing. Uh, so here you can, uh, you know, I can bind further, right? So I can say 20 or whatever. 
now it prints 35. So here basically the first two parameters of my original add have been bound to 5 and 10. So to 5 plus 10 is 15. So basically we are composed on top of 2, right? So it can keep going like that. Obviously till you have zero parameters, you can't go beyond that. Uh, so this is actually another you know, use case for using closures, right? Here a lot of stuff is being passed around through closures. Uh, <coughs> There are a couple of other techniques that I want to talk about, memoization and throttling and devancing and all, but I don't think I'll have time for that. Do you have questions? Uh, Practical use for the partials. Partial mind. It's exactly this, right? So, uh, whenever you want to create, uh, uh, you know, you want to kind of build an abstraction on top of an existing function, right? Any kind of scenario, building higher order function as you were saying. Code reuse can be a really good example. Code, code reuse can be a yeah, like maybe the, the constant, you know, it's not very useful to put 5 there, right? Maybe you have some runtime logic that determines that value. But you want a variant of a function where that particular parameter is permanently bound to that value. Maybe you dynamically compute that value. You could use it there. Any more questions? Maybe we can continue with the memoization we have about. Yes. Then or probably what I'll do is I'll talk about throttling and devancing as more sure. exciting. Okay, only five minutes. So, you know, uh, this is basically another uh, technique that is again enabled by the functional uh, you know, nature of the language. So, let's say you have some event source, right? Uh, most of the time, what are we doing with client side programming in JavaScript? We are like, Handling events, responding to events, right? Web development is about event based development. You're responding to events all the time. Uh, what if, let's say you have a scenario where the event source uh, is kind of generating the, uh, the events at a, at a greater frequency than is desired? There are events like that, right? For example, mouse move, uh, window scroll, right? And you want to do things in response to that. In fact, uh, I, I have to read about this in a, in, a, uh, in a blog post where Twitter ran into an issue. So you know how, how it works in the Twitter web application, right? They, they implement something called infinite scroll. So you can keep scrolling the page as you hit the as you near the end of the page, it loads the next page of tweets from all the people that you follow, right? And then it keeps going. So you can keep on scrolling infinitely. How do they implement that? They implement it by handling the scroll event of your of your uh, window object. Uh, in the initial implementations, <laughs> it turned out that this kind of you know really dragged the performance of the of the site of Twitter.com, right? Uh, and when they investigated, what they found was the on scroll was just getting fired like crazy, right? And and in each of that event, they were doing some logic. Probably was never the logic as well, where they were you know trying to fetch the next page of things in response to that. <coughs> then can scale very well. So if you have situations like that, uh, maybe I'll just show you the demo here instead of showing you the code, which I don't think I'll have time for. Um, so here's a here's an example of that, right? So I have basically uh, implemented. Uh, scroll on this on this uh, page. Now, let me just show you what happens if I don't throttle it. So I'll just take off this called throttle here. Uh, so now when I scroll, you can see that it's like generating the events like crazy, right? Every time I, you can see by the way that progress bar is going up. Uh, now what I'll do is I'll slightly change this code to call a function that I've defined here called throttle. Just refresh that. So now when I uh, you know, I'm just like scrolling the page. Now it's a little bit more disciplined. It's like more controlled, right? Essentially, what's happening here is the event source has been throttled to to kind of pass through that event only once every two fifty milliseconds. So no matter how frequently the event is getting raised, your handler will get called only once every two fifty milliseconds. And the code for that here is, uh, you know, you can. It's really straightforward. Like from the original handler, I just wrapped it inside throttle and passed the uh, you know the duration for that. Throttle your own device, or is it? Yes. So in this here, I have a throttle. I mean, it's again not rocket science. You can probably figure it out. Uh, <coughs> this again is there on my blog. Take a look at it. The other thing, a similar sort of technique, is called debouncing. Uh, the idea here is. Uh, so this is debounce done. Okay. So same way. What I'll do is I'll just take. Uh, maybe I can't do that here. So let's say, you know, this is another example, a scenario where let's say you have an online collaboration application, right? You know, how many of you have used Google Wave? Not of you. So you know how, how it works, right? Um, like the, the really fancy new feature was that if you are typing something, other people who are collaborating with you at that point in time can see what you're typing. Right? As you type, other people can see it. So if you wanted to implement that, how would you do it? 
So here again is, a, is an example of an event source if you are a really fast type, typist uh, where that event can, generate it, can get generated at a faster rate than you would like. Right? In that case, you probably want to do something similar to throttling, but throttling will not work there. Uh, so there is something that, you know, debouncing is a, is a technique where you might use that. So for example here, right, uh, I'm going to, okay, let's see. So basically what I've done here is whatever I type in this text box, it's going to print that here. It's going to say sending whatever I've typed, right. And the idea here is to, to provide as real time an experience as possible for these people who are collaborating. Just imagine that when you see sending, that message is getting sent to all the other participants who are on that on that build application. So the idea here is, one thing that I could have done is, every time I press the key, I could handle the key press event and uh, send it to the other, other attendees, right? That will not scale very well because if I type fast, too many events get generated, my server is going to just start trying on the... So what, what can you do? So here I could do something like this, right? I am going to type very, very fast. And now you can see that as soon as I stop typing, the uh, something happened there, right? That's the point when it got sent, right? So the idea here is, if you look at this code here, uh, it's very similar to the, to the throttling code, except what I've done is, I've called a different function called dbounce, and uh, this is my handler. And I'm doing this append here, right? Whenever whenever my handler gets called, I take the data and append to the, my to my evil list, but imagine that I send it across the network to other things. Uh, what debounce will do is, uh, here you can see that there is a duration, a 2 to 3 millisecond, right? So as I am typing, so if I type really, really slowly, I am typing slowly. So here when I type slowly, you can see that the characters are actually getting sent character by character. But if I type like really, really fast, right, then you can see that only that gets sent. So the, do you see the difference in the behavior here? Basically, if the time difference between two consecutive events is less than 250 milliseconds, then all the events get, uh, you know, kind of uh, coerced, right? And only one invocation happens for your actual function. Uh, if it is greater than 250 milliseconds, then obviously your, your fall happens. Which is why if I type really slowly, uh, then so if I type very slowly, then it happens because the interval between those two events is greater than 2 milliseconds. The interval is you know, less than that, then uh, I don't think I have time to show you the code. Again, it's not too complicated. One more minute. Yes. So I'll use that one more minute to tell you where you can get that code. Uh, so those are a lot of URLs which if you write really, really fast, you can note down. Or what you can do is just uh, look at that bit.ly slash that's my blog address. Can you uh, share the slides also? Yes, I'll share the slides. So you'll have these links if you can look at the